really about creating a, a more diversified economy and really working with the agriculture industry to support them. With little more than a week left until Albertans head to the polls, the last minute messages party leaders are working to push home. And if every house had a bin, you could just get rid of rid of that one organic bag right then and there. This is CBC Edmonton News. Good evening. It is great to have you joining us tonight. I'm Nancy Carlson. A trial began this morning in Edmonton for a man accused of viciously attacking a stranger with a crowbar in a road rage incident. Jared Matthew Eliason pleaded not guilty to attempted murder. His alleged victim has begun to testify. Now, we do want to warn you that the language in this story might be offensive to some of our audience members. Here's CBC's Janice Johnson. Early in the morning on March 7, two years ago, Chelsea Chandelors was driving home after dropping her fiancé off at work. Her dash cam video shows a car was blocking an intersection. The 34-year-old honked her horn, and finally the driver moved enough so she could get by. Shenzelors described the next terrifying and painful minutes. As she was parked in front of her house, she saw the same silver car approach. A man got out and walked towards her holding a crowbar. She got out of her vehicle. I thought he was going to start yelling at me for honking the horn, and he raised up with both hands and swung down. He hit her once on the left arm. She testified. He raised the bar again and said, Die, bitch, die and it came crashing down again. The sound from the dash cam video is horrifying. Both of her arms were broken. The Crown said she was struck a number of times in her upper body while the accused was attempting to strike her in the head. She was able to block the blows. A picture later taken by police shows damage to the victim's car. The victim is sure it was caused by the crowbar. The trial's been told Jared Eliason had a job delivering newspapers in the area where the attack occurred. He was arrested and charged the next day. The prosecutor has told the judge the key issue in this trial will be identification of the accused. Now, when she was in hospital, the victim was shown a photo lineup. She picked out two men. Neither of them was Eliason. But today in court, she clearly pointed at Jared Eliason in the prisoner's box as the man who attacked her. Janice Johnson, CBC News, Edmonton. The man charged in a pair of stabbings in Edmonton's inner city last month has a violent criminal past that included the kidnapping of a well-known radio host during a high-profile crime spree. Emily Fitzpatrick joins us with more. So, Emily, let's actually start with the most recent details in this case. Sure, of course. So, last week, police charged Clayton Thomas Berard with first-degree murder in the death of Rose Knife. She was stabbed on March 28th outside the George Spady Centre. Then, the very next night, Albert Stevens was stabbed a few blocks away outside of the Boyle Street Community Centre. He is in stable condition in hospital, and Berard has also been charged with attempted murder in that attack. Now, Emily, actually, this isn't the first time Berard has faced charges, though, is it? No. So, back in 2002, Berard and an accomplice made headlines for a series of home invasions, robberies, thefts, and a hostage taking that stretch from Lac La Biche to Fort Saskatchewan. This is some footage we have from back then. Police said the crime spree began when Berard and his accomplice held up a liquor store. Then they invaded a farmhouse using an axe to rob and terrorize a woman inside. And then finally, in Lamont, Alberta, armed with a rifle and a knife, the pair barged into the home of, late, of the late Stan Thompson, a well-known Ched radio host. They demanded cash and credit cards, but there was nothing in the house. So instead, they took Thompson and his wife to a nearby bank machine at gunpoint. But during an argument between Berard and his partner, Thompson and his wife managed to get away. So those two were eventually arrested by police, and in 2004, Berard was sentenced to nine and a half years in prison. Flash forward to now, Berard is scheduled to appear in court on Friday in relation to those stabbings. Definitely an interesting case, and we'll be keeping an eye on that. Thank you so much, Emily. You're welcome. 
A date has now been set for the reopening of the Strathcona County Library. May 8th. Restoration work has been ongoing since last November. That's when two explosions and a fire started in the parkade next to the library. Around 200,000 items in the library had to be professionally vacuumed, wiped clean, and then put back on the shelves. While the library will be reopened, you still won't be able to park in the parkade. A reopening date for it hasn't been set. The city of Edmonton has been fined $1,000 after pleading guilty in connection to the deaths of three feral cats. Last May, several cats were transported from the city's animal care and control center to another city facility as part of a pilot program designed to provide homes for feral cats. Three cats died within a day of being moved. The Alberta Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals laid charges. The city says it will make improvements based on the findings of a review. It plans to relaunch the program by the end of 2019. The leader of the NDP expects to get federal government approval for the Trans Mountain Pipeline by the end of next month. On the campaign trail today, Rachel Notley was at the Pipefitters Union in West Edmonton. She says almost 7 in 10 Canadians support the Trans Mountain Project. While she is not saying she's been given any information from the federal government, she says she just believes there is support for the pipeline. Here's what she had to say about it during her live interview on CBC Alberta at noon. Of course, it's always a risk to predict the future, but honestly, I would, I would bet my mortgage. I, as I said earlier today, I'd bet my political future. I think we will have shovels back in the ground this fall. Jason Kenney also talking about relations with BC today. He says he's ready to put the West Coast on notice. If elected, Kenney says the first thing he will do is enact Bill 12, the law that would allow him to turn off the taps and restrict oil exports to British Columbia. He says the NDP drew up the law but never intended on using it. Meanwhile, the leader of the Alberta Party says he would put $100 million into a fund to help the agriculture sector innovate. Stephen Mandel pointed to canola farmers as one group that might need to diversify. Right now is having challenges because we can't get access to the Chinese market. So we need to find ways that we can move up the value chain. And we think this uh, uh, $100 million program will offer opportunities to do research and do the kind of things necessary to create value added in the system. So we're not always susceptible to foreign governments changes in what they want to do. Well, the Liberal Party's full policy platform is now out. It includes plans for justice reforms and expanded human rights. Party leader David Kahn says the Alberta Liberals have the boldest environmental strategy of any party in this election. Alberta's carbon tax is a hot button issue in this election. Many are divided on the costs and the benefits. So here's a look at how much it does cost, where that money is now going, and whether or not it's made an impact on greenhouse gas emissions. So let's talk about Alberta's carbon tax. Put in place in January 2017, it started at $20 per ton, which bumped up to 30 bucks a ton the next year. It taxes diesel, gas, natural gas, and propane at the pump or on heating bills. There are exceptions, like some gas and diesel used for farming. So how much did it bring in? Overall, the carbon tax is projected to bring in $2.6 billion by the end of March, with another $899 million from the large emitter's carbon tax, a fund put in place in 2009 under the PCs. So where does the money go? Well, into the coffers of 15 different provincial departments. Roughly 300 communities got a piece, everything from solar panels to upgrading schools. Calgary and Edmonton take a big slice for LRT lines. But the biggest share goes to rebates and small business tax reductions. There's money for Alberta's coal phase-out, which should wrap by 2030. Energy efficiency grants were given for everything from LED light bulbs to low-flow showerheads. There's also the projects funded by the tax on large emitters. That's that separate fund. So research and innovation projects aimed at reducing greenhouse gases through technology. The NDP are running on the carbon tax. Rachel Notley speaks of its success while lobbying for Alberta's energy industry across Canada. 
UCP leader Jason Kenney says his first piece of legislation would be to scrap it. Absolutely. His party feels it hasn't made a dent in greenhouse gases, and it's killing jobs. Alberta emitted 38% of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions in 2015, the highest in Canada. The NDP's climate plan wants to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50 megatons by 2030. Even if Alberta does stop charging for carbon, there's always the federal government. Despite legal challenges, Ottawa has its own carbon tax, so it most likely remain a hot-button issue. And just remember, this only captures the spending up to the beginning of this year, so a lot more has been earmarked for rebates and small business tax cuts. Figures provided by the Alberta government forecasted carbon levy rebates to climb to $525 million in 2018-19, bringing the total in rebates to nearly $1 billion by the end of March. The small business tax cut was estimated to cost $415 million in the same time frame. Uh, fans are frustrated. It's our job to get it right, uh, and that's what we're going to try to do in the next uh, month ahead. Oilers Brass laying out what's ahead for the team after another disappointing season, and of course, they were also asked about McDavid's injury. It is a very exciting day here at CBC Edmonton because we get to show off this brand new set. So much work has gone into it. So now I'm going to give you a little bit of a behind the scenes look at what I get to see. So first of all, this is the desk. Do run our own teleprompter. That's on the ground there. And yeah, this is the this is the desk that we stand. Try not to lean on it too much. This is my home base. This is the background. We can change the different images that go into these screens. So obviously right now we have, we have this one. That one runs uh, for most of the newscast, but we cannot change all the pictures, everything like that, that go into those, into those screens. And now comes the part that probably a lot of you haven't seen. This is what I see. So <laughs> these are our cameras. We have three cameras, and they can do all sorts of different angles. Um, they can do close-ups, they'll do far away. It's our wide shots, I guess I should say. Uh, it's really cool, uh, all, the different, all the different things that can happen with the cameras there. Now, the great thing about this newsroom here at CBC Edmonton that I want to show you is that our newsroom is right behind us. So anytime anything happens, the, whoever has the information can run and tell, they can tell it to me. They can also tell it to our control room. So behind these doors, that's where really all of the magic really happens. Um, our show, as you can see, uh, there's no one else in here. This, our show is actually produced or controlled out of Toronto, and then they communicate to everyone in the control room, and then they communicate that to me. So it's pretty cool how much technology has changed how the television industry gets our information out to you. So that's pretty well it for the tour of this incredible studio. Again, we are so, so grateful to be able to be sharing it with you tonight. Um, yeah, we're almost out of this commercial break. So I'm gonna head back to the desk there. Thanks for watching, talk to you soon. It's election season in Alberta and CBC's got you covered with several tools to keep you up to date on election news. Vote Compass lets you see how your views stack up against each of the parties. It can be weighted to focus on the issues that matter to you. You can also find all the latest polling numbers on our poll tracker, which you can access anytime from our election homepage. Our election team is tracking the promises made by candidates on the campaign trail. Follow along with Promise Tracker to see which parties are following through. Then each week, legislative reporters Kim Trinacity and Michelle Belfontaine share behind-the-scenes drama and humor on the Ledge podcast. And don't forget to sign up for our newsletter, The Scrutineer, to receive the latest election news right in your email inbox. You can find all of our election content at cbc.ca slash albertavotes.
The owner of a piece of a prime downtown real estate has won an appeal over a six-figure tax bill. Regency Developments appealed its 2018 tax assessment for the site of the former Bank of Montreal at 102nd Avenue and 101st Street. Last spring, the company demolished the building, and by the end of April, the lot was cleared. At City Hall today, Regency argued it was taxed more than $124,000 for a building that wasn't there for much of the year. Regency plans to build a mixed-use tower on the lot and hopes to start with a parkade this year. With more than 150,000 dogs in the city, there's a plenty of poop. But once you've bagged it like a responsible dog owner, where does it go? Well, the city of Edmonton is now upcycling the organic waste into a green reusable product. Take a look. Well, normally, um, uh, the dog poo arrives uh, currently in a um, waste stream, uh, the garbage stream, which is basically a black bag that the residents throw out. The pet waste does fall into the organic fraction, and we do want to um, um, avoid sending that to landfill. So we uh, want to um, basically divert as much as possible um, of anything, whether it's organic fraction or non-organic fraction. Fraction. It goes through a facility which we call uh, integrated processing facility, uh, and it has a lot of uh, mechanical uh, separation. So there's a, a, a thermal screen, and it has a certain amount of holes, and the organic fraction generally falls through those holes, and it goes to that kind of a, a system, and then eventually, the organic fraction makes its way to the ECF, uh, which is a composting facility. And I think every company that deals with pets or owners of dogs, cats, anything that deals with the feces of animals, I think needs to know how to dispose of things properly. And so I think increasing the knowledge in the beginning of all dog owners or all pet owners would be very effective. We make sure that all of our utensils are clean, our bucket and everything like that. And believe it or not, as crazy as this sounds, we put a glove on our hand, we bend down and we put it in the bucket. The Edmonton Oilers are moving full steam ahead to find a new general manager. The team CEO, Bob Nicholson, held the news conference along with interim GM Keith Gretzky this morning at Rogers Place to talk about that. Plus, give us an update on Connor McDavid's injury. CBC's Min Dariwal has more. Well, Bob Nicholson admitted that he's heard the frustration from fans, even the team's captain, about the struggles the team has faced this year. A second straight season, and this team is nowhere near the postseason or the playoffs. On January 22nd, he fired then general manager Peter Torelli, and you could say the search for a new GM started back then. Interim GM Keith Gretzky has done a respectable job the last two and a half months, and Nicholson credits Gretzky for that, who is also a candidate for the job. Nicholson said there are a number of other candidates and he wants to make sure he gets the right person. I'd like to hire the general manager tomorrow, but that's not going to happen. Uh, as I've said before, I'm not going to rush the process. Um, we're going to do a deep dive. As Bob mentioned, there's his work he has to do and, and uh, you have to accept the process and, and move forward. Nicholson and Gretzky also addressed McDavid's scary injury from Saturday night in Calgary where many thought he'd broken his leg. Those x-rays after the game came back negative and on Sunday the captain underwent an MRI. We can't go too far on it, we're still evaluating it, but it's not as serious as we thought. But it's, hey, it's Connor, it's an injury, it's serious for our organization. Next up for Nicholson and Gretzky, the NHL draft lottery, which goes in Toronto tomorrow. The Oilers are sitting in seventh spot with a 6.5% chance of vaulting into first place. That position is currently occupied by the Colorado Avalanche, who have an 18.5% chance of picking first overall in the NHL draft this summer in Vancouver. At Rogers Place, Mindari Wall, CBC News, Edmonton. All right, so where did the Oilers go so wrong? Many of the core players had career years, yet their season, it just seemed doomed right out of the gate. Hockey analyst Sunil Agnihotri is here with his take. So let's start off a uh, little bit of a post-mortem here on this disappointing season. Um, 
What do you think were the uh, key reasons for the Oilers' lack of success this year? Yeah, with the, with the season going the way it did and just a lack of progress over the last couple of years, you can point to a number of factors, but I think it all boils down just to the lack of offense that this team was able to generate this year. They're bottom five in terms of goal scoring, in terms of even generating shots and scoring chances. That's how you knew the season wasn't going to end well. Um, and the fact that, you know, things like the penalty kill, goaltending was inconsistent, but I just felt like the depth scoring combined with, uh, with the penalty kill, special teams was an issue. They just could not get it together at any point in the year. I mean, even if you look over the course of the year, when they trended well, there's only maybe a blip of 10 games early in the year. But other than that, they were consistently bad. Mm -hmm. um, it's due to the lack of, obviously, the depth uh, that they have up front and on the back end. But they just haven't had that steady stream of, of young prospects coming into onto their team, guys that can play on value deals and contribute. And so those are items that they will need to address right away here. What about, uh, what do you take away from this morning's press conference? You know, the Edmonton Oilers are just a desperate hockey team at this point, and they just haven't put their words into action. I mean, we've we heard the same sort of comments that Bob Nicholson was saying at the at the season ticket holder events. You know, that they're looking for a general manager. They're gonna you know do as many interviews as they can. I mean, Bob Nicholson did talk about things like analytics and sports science today, but again, until he puts those words into actions. The fans are going to continue to have a low level of confidence in his ability to be CEO. Um, I thought it was a little awkward for Keith Gretzky to be up there considering he's interim GM, yet he's you know still applying for the job. And he spoke at, when he was on the podium as if he had the job at some point, and he would talk about what he would do in that spot. Um, so I think he gave himself a, a bit of a, uh, an interview right there, just explaining what he wanted to do. Um, but all in all, I just felt like it was a typical Oiler away. You know, they, they, you, you would hope that they would make some action right away here, take a much more aggressive approach, put some you know, common sense business practices in place, but they still seem to be very lethargic in their decision making. There's no sense of aggression or urgency yet. And I just feel like Bob Nicholson has really deferred a lot of those key decisions to whoever the next general manager is and again that boils down to you know fans don't have a lot of confidence at this point but um, these are things that hopefully the team can address right away here so what do you think the team needs to do? Obviously, they have some hiring to do, but what else does the team need to do during this offseason then? Yeah, it's going to be really interesting. Obviously, the general manager position is going to be important, but it's it's not going to come down to one or two big moves. I don't think it is. I think it's going to come out, come down to a number of, of, of little moves around the edges that's really going to you know, push the needle for this team. Um, one thing that the others will need to do is, is look at their salary, um, look at their salary cap right now, and, and really take ruthless decisions on, on what they want to do. There's a lot of dead cap space. Guys that are are playing on, on contracts that just aren't producing. Milan Lucic comes to mind, but same with guys like Chris Russell as well. I think what the others really need to do is look at players on their roster who have whose value is higher than it actually is. You could point to Nugent Hopkins and say, well, he had a career year. This might be the time to trade him away for a defenseman. But I would look at guys like Darnell Nurse and Chris Russell, who whose value is, is very high right now, who, you know, especially Darnell Nurse, who's going to be needing a new contract pretty soon, and it's not going to be cheap. And Chris Russell, who is actually just a detriment to the team, especially on the penalty kill. Um, if the others can look for uh, look at the market for those types of players and make some moves off that, I think that's going to be key. Um, and then just finding that influx of young talent. Bakersfield has done really well this year, but they really need to take their time in, in moving some of these guys up. I think some of them can make the jump pretty, pretty soon here, but I think the others will need to continue finding that stream of young talent and that's going to come up at the draft this summer. And quickly, we are obviously not watching the Oilers in the playoffs. Who do you have your eyes on? Well, it's going to be, I think this is going to be a really exciting playoffs. I think it's going to be teams like Tampa Bay, Nashville. Um, Winnipeg is one of those teams that I wish would do well just because they got some really high-end talent on their team, but they've, they've struggled. But I think it's going to come down to Tampa. And I'm, I'm going to think Tampa and Vegas this, uh, this year. All right. We'll keep our eyes on that. Thanks, Neil. Appreciate hey, it. Anytime. <laughs>
this is home. Mm -hmm. So this is where I'm at now. And you're, you haven't been here for very long either. No, I think it's been exactly a week since right. I drove in. Yeah. I want to say arrived, but I didn't, I didn't come on a plane, people. I drove you here. You took the scenic route, hey? Definitely How was the it? scenic route. There was some hail, some rain, some sun, some sleeping, not while driving. So, yeah, <laughs> just to clarify. Yeah, yeah. It, it was incredible. I got to see parts of Canada that I didn't even know existed. Mm -hmm. I got to see small towns. I got to see Hinton. I got to see all these places I didn't know about. And that's why we do what we do, right? We get to learn. Yeah. Um, what have you What have you seen here in Edmonton? What do you like? What have you been? I know you've only been here a week, so I don't mean to put. I don't expect that you that you've all of a sudden explored the city end to end. But yeah, I've been everywhere. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a lot of family here, so I've actually seen a little bit of Edmonton in the suburbs. But now I'm getting to see different parts. I'm getting to see downtown. I'm exploring Jasper Avenue. I've tried to find every spin studio in the city. If anyone has suggestions, let me know. All right. That is important. A yeah. spin studio. Uh, uh, you've shown me all the running places well, so, yeah. <laughs> well I try to but um, yeah what else do you like to I know family is so important to you yes you do know that I think I talk about them way too it's, much no so. not at all it's wonderful it is absolutely wonderful yeah I so. think family lots of spending time with family uh, looking for good books again so that's something I enjoy doing when I'm not here uh, mm -hmm. I love to read I look like an extrovert but I'm kind yes. of a secret <laughs> introvert who likes to read and spend some solo time I love that yes just when you're out in public because we are we're in the public eye a lot yeah. So then I think there's the expectation that it's like always this, but sometimes I'm just like, I need to be a hermit for a little yeah. while. No you know? makeup, hide a little yeah. bit, wear my glasses and read my books. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I, how did you get into journalism too? I, long story short, I was five and I said, I'm going to be a journalist. I'm going to be a storyteller. I'm going to give a voice to people who don't have that voice. And here we are now. That is fantastic, and you have come so far, and it is so exciting. I mean, we've only known each other for a week, but I already Best feel like already. she's like a we great got friend this. of mine. Yeah. Tune in so, here all the time. Yeah. 6 o'clock, I'll be watching. And at 11. And make right. sure you're watching the weekend. Yeah, that's right. Yes, you'll be there as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Good job. Same to you. We got this, Edmonton. Yeah, we got this. This weather update is brought to you by Capital GMC Buick. The pre-owned SUV event is on now. Oh, what a beautiful day in our city. So I was out for a run and I snapped these photos of the River Valley and that sunshine. It was part of my Instagram takeover of the CBC Edmonton account. So you can still actually check that out. And we want to share your photos each night. So please post them on social media and you want to tag CBC Edmonton. Show us what you see out there. And hopefully we're going to be seeing some more sunshine. Well, not a bad way to start our week. We're sitting at 14 degrees right now and it looks like that warm weather might continue. I do not want to jinx it. Maybe this is the start of spring for real this time. Our community is just full of gems and at CBS Edmonton, we love sharing them with you. Like the Telephone Historical Center, which you can connect with at the Prince of Wales Armouries Heritage Center. Here's a tour that may ring a few bells. So this is the Telephone Historical Center. We are a telecommunications museum. We were started almost 32 years ago in 1987 by Edmonton Telephones, which was the local telephone company. The city first got the telephone here in 1885. So the long history of the telephone industry here in Edmonton is what led to the company later starting this museum. Around 2004, the museum moved to our current location with the Prince of Wales Armouries building. A lot of the times we get school groups, but also just families that bring in their kids, grandparents bringing in their grandkids to show them how the old telephones used to work when they were younger. Our collection dates back to 1878. That's our oldest telephone. And it was a phone that was made by Alexander Graham Bell in his office down in Boston. And it goes all the way up to the current cell phones that we have. We have smartphones in our collection. 
it's definitely hard to tell kids that there was a point where your phone just stayed in one spot and never went anywhere with you. <laughs> um, and also that it only made phone calls. There was no texting and there was no speed dial or anything like that. You actually had to remember people's phone numbers or look it up in the phone book. It just had one purpose and it just stayed where it was and it was wired in. It's definitely interesting when kids come in. It shows where phones came from and it gives them a chance to see how technology has progressed so much just within the most recent decades. It's definitely a lot of fun. <laughs> Well, there was quite a light show over northern Europe this weekend. Scientists in Norway launched two rockets containing colored chemicals into the aurora borealis on Friday night. The goal, to visually track charged particles as they drift down to Earth. The result, my gosh, look at this. This is an extra special celestial masterpiece. Well, that's all for us right now. Your next newscast is at 11 with Zara Premji. In the meantime, you can head to cbc.ca. Thank you so much for joining us.